I think these trials are completely unacceptable. You'd love to have cabbages which are weed free. And birds. Tougher and tougher. We will not put on Santo bullshitting. I promise you. But if there's anything wrong with this technology, I'll be the first to tell you. Across Britain, the debate about genetically modified organisms in our crops and our food becomes more heated by the day. It, it's not just saying it's 99.99%. If it's 0.01%, it's still too much contamination. It may be that all these products are completely safe, but we will not see that evidence for a long period of time, and we are the guinea pigs. The latest battle in the war over genetically modified or GM foods could change the very landscape we live in. The traditional British countryside is becoming home to something a little less traditional. Here at Lush Hill Farm in Wiltshire, they're growing a different kind of crop. This is looking quite good, this bit here. Yeah, this isn't too bad at all. Manager John Messer is showing Captain Fred Barker how it's coming along. It looks just like any other plant. That, that is it. That's it, yeah. Exactly the same in all intents and purposes and everything else, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. But it's not the same. This oilseed rape has had an extra gene added to it, which means it won't die when the field's sprayed with a particular kind of weed killer. Weeds off that we don't want. But while the rape won't die, almost all the weeds will. The field is part of a government trial, and Captain Barker can see the advantages such a crop may give farmers like him. We've got a major weed problem on this farm, and possibly we go over the same piece of ground five times with a sprayer, two times for weeds, maybe three times for weeds. This genetically modified herbicide tolerant crop did seem to me a very good way forward for us from the farming point of view. But not everyone shares his view. Last week, Captain Barker met up with some of the locals. Many don't want the trials. They don't believe they're safe for the countryside. But Captain Barker hopes to reassure them. We're just sitting here waiting to hear from the government. I hope I can persuade you to understand that I'm very proud of my farm and I'm very proud of everything we do on it. Thank you, Captain Barker. Um, um, but many other farmers are concerned about the impact the trials will have on their farms. Um, I'm getting slightly emotional tonight because it's, it's really does threaten my livelihood, this. Um, Pete Richardson has an organic farm a few miles down the road from Captain Barker's fields. He's worried that pollen carried across from Lush Hill could cause genetic contamination of his crops. The general public um, are really, really angry about this. And I am angry because as a grower, I can't guarantee in the future to provide organic food for people who want it. I'm not a very big grower, but the people who want it, want it, and they want choice, and they are not going to have choice. Yeah. We have yeah. choice yeah. 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 I think there's an enormous amount at stake here. I think there's the right of every consumer to make an informed choice about what they eat and also of every farmer and grower to be able to grow organic crops uh, free from genetic contamination. I think we need to test. I as a farmer need to know the answer. You as a consumer need the answer. If we keep it in the laboratory, We'll never know. Some would say that's where it should stay, but I believe we have to make progress. This is not just a local issue. Fears about genetic modification of food have been growing throughout the country. But it's only recently those fears have been focused on farming. Most of the public protest over the last few months has been about the food we buy, and it's supermarkets who've been the main target. Once, shopping used to be a simple affair. Now, you have to be a detective. 
The latest quest is checking whether food's natural or whether it's GM, now being called Frankenstein food. Over 60% of processed food may have some form of GM ingredient in it, and until recently, we didn't even know. Shoppers are worried. You don't know what effect it's going to have on us, do you? You know, in the future. The government denied all knowledge of BSE, and we'll look where we are now. Despite all the debate, most ordinary shoppers still feel in the dark about genetically modified foods. But according to some scientists, the stakes could hardly be higher. When it comes to genetically modified foods, we're basically conducting the kinds of tests that should be done in a laboratory context. We're doing it with the public at large. In Stroud and Gloucestershire last February, 500 people tried to persuade local shops to clear GM food from their shelves. The Frankenstein food scare had moved from the supermarket aisles to the streets. Even the local Labour MP reckoned the government and its advisers had been too quick to side with the multinationals behind the GM industry. The whole GM question is one about these unaccountable, invisible forces who seemingly took decisions that were decisions that people are now seriously questioning. And I think the governments have got to sit up and actually reflect what the people say rather than the larger companies. The government and most scientists say GM is safe, but a vocal minority of experts disagree, and that's fueled the protests. And we want to hand it over to the... Uh... Most big supermarket chains have now banned GM from their own products. Tesco's were the last to hold out. Send it to your head office, get a reply as soon as you can to assure the people of that that's what you're going to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll be doing exactly what this young man has asked me to do and send it off to my head office. But it wasn't until the end of last month that the manager's bosses finally responded. Well, I don't think we've been slow to react. I think we've been, you know, monitoring very carefully what our customers have been telling us. You know, yes, we have had uh, some pressure groups uh, marching into some stores and saying, you Tesco ought to be doing this. But at the end of the day, we have to be responsible to what our customers want. And it's our customers that in the last eight weeks have said, we'd we'd, well, one in four of our customers have said, we'd like you to have a GM-free option. So it's that, it's that reason that uh, in the last few weeks we've decided that we will now take GM out of those, uh, ingre of those products where we have it. But that will take a while. And so to help identify alternative suppliers, Tesco have made an extraordinary alliance with a pressure group. Greenpeace. We're no longer on two sides of the fence, you know, throwing bricks at each other if that's what was happening. But we are cooperating now to provide what customers want. It's not just the supermarkets who've bowed to public pressure to remove genetically modified ingredients from their shelves. In the last few weeks, even the big food manufacturers like Unilever, Nestle and Cadbury's have had to bend to meet consumer demands. Do you remember I talked to you about different communities, different animal and plant communities, and how that they all link up in some way? In schools too, like here in Gloucester, old certainties about food, that it's natural and safe, are being eroded by the Frankenstein food scare. Matthew. Rely. Rely, good boy, excellent. Right, Rianne, you're going to be... Most of what kids take in about GM foods comes not from teachers, but from the press. Plenty of scope for confusion. That's my impression. Sam, what, what do you think of GM foods? Um, very disturbing, actually, because a small child could eat them and probably get seriously injured. Why do you think that? Um, because they've mixed around with all the chemicals and it could be dangerous. What do you make about all the publicity about Frankenstein foods to that scale? Yes. Sam may be taking it a bit far, but last autumn, parents in Gloucestershire were worried enough to ask the council to cut GM foods out of school meals altogether. The council hasn't yet been able to renegotiate its contract with its caterers, but they have agreed on a voluntary policy of not knowingly serving genetically modified food to their pupils. You've effectively decided to ban GM foods from Gloucestershire schools. Um, aren't you being a bit hysterical? No, I don't think we are. And there was certainly no atmosphere of hysteria at the time the decision was taken. We're essentially responding to parents' concerns. With school meals, if parents don't want a particular type of food, the only way we can guarantee that is to take that out. Chicken, please, ma'am. Boys? 
Now the local government association, like supermarkets and food manufacturers, wants to phase GM foods out. And yet, despite all this nationwide opposition, the government still wants to be part of the GM revolution. We can't isolate ourselves from a world in which genetically modified crops and genetically modified food products are being produced. The potential for the biosciences uh, uh, in this economy, in the British economy, is enormous. And it would be foolish for, a self, for us, for this government, to cut ourselves off from that potential. We're a world leader in the field. Despite the government still backing the principle of genetic modification, the public mood remains one of alarm, with schools and supermarkets being forced to ban GM foods altogether. But how did we get to this position? After all, the government has whole teams of official advisers to try and make sure the crops and food we eat are safe. Well, the answer, our investigation shows, is that throughout the 90s, crucial warnings went unheeded. The fears of consumers were overlooked. And key issues, like whether we really want GM food at all, were simply not addressed. The GM story began here with a tomato devised by a British scientist, Donald Grierson. All living organisms have genes written in their DNA. They're the chemical instructions on how to grow and live. By modifying one of the plant's genes, Grierson produced tomatoes that made a thicker puree, a GM crop that seemed to produce a real benefit. We're studying a whole range of genes that affect the color, flavor, texture, and other quality attributes, including the nutritional value. And I think that genetic modification is going to lead to better foods, more flavorsome and more wholesome foods, which are better to eat. Grierson's tomatoes contained a gene taken from another tomato plant that had been altered to make the tomatoes stay especially firm while they ripened. We were very pleased. The science was done first here, and it was great to see it develop into a product which consumers could benefit from. It's almost the same as the regular variety, just one gene changed in the several tens of thousands. The experts who decided a tomato almost the same as normal was safe to eat are the Advisory Committee on Novel Foods and Processes, the ACNFP. Most are scientists with connections to the food or biotechnology industry. There was just one member to represent consumers. It's the committee's job to make sure novel foods don't contain some novel ingredient that could harm us. After giving the green light to the British tomato, they had to decide if American soya beans were safe beans with a genetic modification invented by the American company Monsanto. To judge whether the GM soybeans were safe, the committee relied on a principle known as substantial equivalence. It looked at Monsanto's application and decided the genetically modified soybeans were substantially equivalent to natural soybeans. And if the natural soybeans were safe, so the GM beans must be too. But what made the American GM soya a more complex issue than the British tomato was that the added gene had come not from a plant, but from a bacterium. And rather than making it taste better, it made the crop resistant to a certain kind